Hey, good morning, everybody. I don't, this is a little informal. I don't know if somebody was supposed to introduce me, but it's 1041 and I like to be punctual, so let's go. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time at RubyConf, first time speaking here, too, so it should be pretty cool. Plus, I've been listening to hip hop all morning to get pumped up for this talk, so. <laughs> Uh, so, um, my name is Micah Adams. Uh, I work for ModeSet, which is a software, it's a software consultancy based out of Denver. Uh, we focus on early stage startups. So we, we do uh, development for them, and our goal is usually to get our startups from Series A to Series B funding. Most recently, we worked with Ello, which is a social network that's ad-free, if anybody's on that. So, pretty cool. Um, so, the title of my talk is Not So Neo in the Matrix, and of course, you're probably wondering why matrices. Um, there's probably two or three groups in this talk right now. Some of you probably use matrices like all the time, and you're awesome at it, so I ask you to be kind to me during the Q&A session, and don't grill me too hard or put my feet to the fire too hard. Uh, others of you might not use matrices at all. Uh, maybe you're kind of newer to programming, maybe you don't have some, such a formal background in programming, things like that. Um, and then some of you might fall into the third camp, which is uh, very much like myself, uh, where actually matrices became like this uh, new revelation because I had just forgotten about how much I'm using them in my code. Um, so for me, this reintroduction happened uh, during kind of a short foray, foray into OpenGL programming on Android. So I had a client who wanted us to develop a virtual reality application using the cardboard um, uh, headset that Google and, and the SDK that Google came out with. Uh, and I did that, it was a really, really quick project. It was only a couple weeks long. Uh, we just slammed out some code for that. But I was getting all batter Meinhof and I started seeing matrices everywhere. I started seeing matrices in my sleep. I started seeing it down the street when I was walking. I started seeing it in old code when I would review like old code that I'd contributed to. I saw, started seeing matrices then. Uh, and it, it became a little bit of an obsession to me and I also realized like, you know, how much I use it versus how much I'm aware of, of when I use it. So I formulated, you know, kind of a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is kind of not that mind-bending. It's pretty straightforward. That matrices are useful in all sorts of situations, and not just in the OpenGL application I was working on, right? Uh, matrices are used everywhere for all kinds of things in all kinds of different domains. So I really wanted to explore that hypothesis with this talk. So what I found out was I had forgotten how prevalent that data structure is. Uh, I use matrices constantly, but without really stopping to consider why I'm using that data structure. And I deeply repressed all memories of calculating the inverse of a three by three matrix by hand. I need therapy for that stuff. Has anybody done that? Any math majors or any? Yeah, so brutal. Like the amount of calculations you have to do, you just thank your lucky stars that uh, computers exist to do this for us, right? The other thing I found out is that Dungeons and Dragons is a great domain for me to explore new domain patterns. I am a ultra mega Dungeons and Dragons nerd. I've been playing since I was like seven years old. I own every edition of the game. I, you know, I've considered getting a Gary Gygax tattoo. I mean, it's really, it's really part of my life. And it's, I'm a domain expert in Dungeons and Dragons, so when you're trying to explore new programming concepts, using your domain expertise is a great way to flesh out those ideas, right? Uh, so we're gonna talk a lot about Dungeons and Dragons in this, and I, I have a little interlude, yeah, <laughs> I have a little interlude for people here who might not be into Dungeons and Dragons, but you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, so what I hope you as the audience get from uh, experiencing this talk is a renewed interest in matrices awareness of when you're using them in your code, but not only awareness, but when you should be just removing it, right? Because as we're gonna see in one of the code examples I have, uh, a matrix in that example is really just brute forcing code. And there's times when it's not appropriate, and there's times where it is appropriate. And when you get like me, you get obsessed with a concept, sometimes you try and insert it everywhere, get too excited about it and put it in places it doesn't belong. So with that, the caveat is your mileage is gonna vary with some of the code examples here. 
Okay, so the, the aim of the talk is not to tell you how to use matrices, but it's to make you more aware of matrices and how they might be used. But if you don't need it, like I said before, if you don't need it, please, please, please leave it out because there are certain times where it's just not very performant. So the too long didn't read talk, so if somebody needs coffee and they're like really not interested in this, you can watch this slide and you can leave and I won't, I won't be hurt, okay? Too long didn't read. Matrices are pretty much just multi-dimensional arrays. Vectors are pretty much just arrays. I just blew your mind right now. Uh, so those are interesting factoids, right? But the context around them is what kind of fleshes out this talk. So we're gonna explore the context of that to a greater degree. So to get more context on those, we're gonna talk about fields, some of the mathematical concepts around fields, talk about vectors and matrices, and then we're gonna go through our three code examples, kind of flesh that stuff out. Uh, so what the heck is a matrix anyway? Well, simply put, it's an array of elements that have been organized into rows and columns. Very simple stuff. Uh, we can think of a matrix as being composed of vectors, right? Uh, so a column and is, in a matrix is a vector. A row in a matrix is a vector. And it can be, the elements of a matrix can be considered as being over what we call over a field. So that begs the question of when do you actually, when should you use a matrix? Um, the snarky, grumpy developer in me wants to say, well, it depends. Um, but one way to, to actually figure that out is when it's appropriate is to look at some places where matrices and vectors and mathematics around them are actually being used in programming, right? So the first thing that everybody thinks about when they think of a matrix or matrix manipulation is in the context of graphics or graphical programming, right? And this literally is just, in some way, shape, or form, using mathematical primitives, polygons, and then manipulating them. Uh, so I don't want to get too much into three-dimensional programming because it's way out of the scope of this talk, so let's talk a little bit about how vectors and vector manipulation can be used on two-dimensional shapes as a quick and easy introduction to this stuff. So what we see here is a little uh, animation of a triangle, and it's being scaled, right? It's kind of like throbbing, scaling over time. It's on a timer, right? Um, how is this actually being achieved? Well, we have some interesting parts of the triangle called vertices, right, which make up the three points of the triangle. And then we're applying a transition on that triangle to make it grow and shrink. Um, and that transformation is being achieved by multiplying the vertices of the polygon by a vector, right? So if we see, if we look at this, uh, assuming that one of the vertices in the above triangle is zero and one, scaling it is multiplicative, and we can just increase its size in that way. That's scaling. So another transformation we can do is translation which is the same concept, except you're moving the triangle around in x and y coordinates or the coordinate space, right? You could also rotate the triangle's vertices by applying this transformation to it, which would rotate it, and you're actually multiplying uh, this matrix of sine and cosine to actually rotate that vertex uh, 90 degrees. So, you know, like I said before, there's a lot more to say about this in the domain of 3D, 3D programming and 2D programming. I, my, the purpose of this talk is to more demystify matrices and I don't wanna get too sidetracked on that. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about it if there's people out there who are graphics gurus, we can talk more about it in the Q&A section, but I think that's pretty good for the scope of this talk. So what are some other applications for matrices and vectors that we might not think about all the time? Well, you can represent probability distributions in a matrix, right? So this is a Markov matrix. Uh, so the first, first row, the way you read this is you can re read through the first row and it breaks out a probability distribution of whether it will be rainy or dry. Each row adds up to one, which is a little factoid about that. Uh, so that's kind of a representation of a state of a system. 
You can also use matrices in cryptography. Ciphers get it. Yeah, I know, it's a terrible one. A cipher can be considered in terms of a matrix, though, right? So here we have a cipher. This is actually, anybody know what cipher this is? This is uh, Caesar's substitutive cipher with a shift value of three. Uh, so given an input A, I would be able to shift it. That, that letter gets shifted to D, et cetera. This is also the Paleolithic age of cryptography, right? Uh, if you guys are storing passwords like this in a database, leave now. <laughs> we can also visualize or understand relational data in terms of matrices, right? So this could be used, this is a force-directed graph. Uh, we care about this kind of stuff in things like social networking, where we're trying to represent relationships between people. So the way you read this is that you have a node of one, uh, and one has an edge that's corollary to four. Uh, and you kind of use the matrix like you would use a map coordinate. So if I wanted to look at four's relationships, I look on the left-hand side, the column of four, and I see that four only has a self-referential relationship. Um, and we use this quite a bit. I mean, you know, this is a representation. I'm not really gonna go too much into detail on the operations on graph structures, but know that eventually you're gonna store this in some way, shape, or form in a matrix. So those are, you know, applications of matrices and vectors. So let's get into some more mathematics or mathematical concepts around this. So let's talk about fields. So a field is a collection of numbers that have the properties of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Uh, you can think of a field as a class that obeys an interface. The interface defines the methods for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And I apologize for inserting Java pseudocode into this talk. I think there's somebody in the back who will hand out pitchforks and torches to route me after the end of the presentation. But as you all know, there's no really true interface uh, style uh, construct in Ruby, so Java makes sense. Anyway, so if we consider the field of real numbers, you know, a real number can be rational or irrational, it can be positive, negative, or zero, and it implements those methods, for lack of a better term, uh, of multiplication, subtraction, division, and addition. There are infinite numbers in this field, so it's kind of hard for us to understand it in terms of a matrix. Because you have infinite elements in the field, what does that really mean for me? Also, as a side note, when you think about the field, uh, you can also think about the field of real numbers as what's on a number scale, right, or a number line. So there's a better example of a field that we use a lot in computing. Uh, and we call this a finite field, or a Galois field. And it's a field that contains a finite number of elements in it. So anybody have a guess what finite field I'm thinking of? Is that? It is. Thinking of specifically two integers. Okay, good. No hardcore math mathematicians in here, I don't think, because the answer I'm looking for is Galois field two. We use that for a binary representation. So Galois field two is a finite field with only two elements, zero and one, right? Um, if you know that and you're being mum, please be kind to me because I'm not a classically trained mathematician. Uh, so we can talk more about that in the Q&A section if you want. So let's digress for a minute and talk about using the finite field because, because of the properties of a Galois field with limited numbers of elements, there's some really interesting things we can do with it in computation. So this is addition on Galois field two as represented by a matrix. And this actually has a specific Boolean property. Does anybody know what that is? Any takers? Exclusive or is what that operation is. Uh, so you can flip bits basically when you are reduced to two elements in your field. Another application is encryption with exclusive or, right? So if you, want to read through this, the, so the column, uh, with, uh, column denoted by P would be a plain text bit, bit, right? The column K is our key, and the column C is the cipher bit that would be uh, encrypted, or that would be the output of encrypting it, uh, encrypting the plain text with the key. Uh, so if you look, the interesting fact of this is that the first row 
given a plain text bit of zero, and I encrypt it with a uh, key of zero, the cipher bit that comes out is zero. On the last row, the plain text bit is one, the key is one, and I also get a zero. So if we assume that that key is truly randomly generated, we can say that exclusive or has the property of perfect secrecy. Uh, and I, you know, perfect secrecy in quotes, because we all know that things get brute forced all the time. But uh, walking backwards, I can't, if I don't know the key, and I have no idea what it, what's going on with the key and how it was generated, I don't really, I can't really use the cipher text to work backwards and derive the plain text. So this is kind of beyond, that's kind of beyond the Paleolithic age of substitutive ciphers, and this is more mathematical ciphers that are used in cryptography. So we digress a little bit and talked about the field and the finite field. Uh, so let's move on to vectors. So since we know what a field is, we can, we can uh, assume the definition of a vector, which is a list of scalars over a specific field. Uh, they're, they're also understood as components of matrices, which we'll look at. So this is an example of a vector over the field of real numbers. This would be, you know, in our, in our terms in Ruby, that's just an array. Uh, here's a vector over the field of Galois field two. Vectors can also be understood in terms of a function. We use this concept all the time in programming, right? So you can uh, refer to things by their index. Uh, so there's a mathematical concept around that. And Ruby's matrix library has a vector class as well. So if you need to do more intensive computation on vectors, you can use Ruby's matrix library for that. So we talked about fields. We know what that is. We know what fields are. Uh, we talked about vectors. So what is a matrix then? Well. In code, we often just use multidimensional arrays to represent matrices, right? Or we can use Ruby's matrix library. We have a code example in this talk, uh, use, give you an example on how you can use that, right? Um, and the, using Ruby's matrix library gives you some extra methods uh, that you can utilize for more intense calculations. There's also a couple of contributed or open source libraries out there like nmatrix that you can use for that. Um, but now I think we should move on to code examples. So the first code example is my favorite because I get to talk ad nauseum about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so this is how you would use matrices and vectors for relational data or subtitled, how D&D always teaches me interesting code concepts. So who knows what D&D is? Everybody, lots of people. All right, so those poor unfortunate people who don't know what Dungeons and Dragons is, this is what it is in about five seconds. It's like World of Warcraft except with pen and paper. Who, knows, who doesn't know what World of Warcraft is? Okay, I won't call you out, I'm sorry. It's just, that's a mean thing to do. Anyway, uh, if you don't know what World of Warcraft is, it's like playing make-believe with stats, dice, pen, and paper. Um, and so in, in, when you're playing D&D, you have a group of characters that play, you have a dungeon master that runs the game, right? Um, and D&D is really composed of a lot of static data that has some inherent relationships in it that apply to your character. So as you adventure through your campaign in D&D, you gain levels, right? You get better at your job, with, and your job is killing orcs and getting loot, right? You get better at that. Uh, so that's a, that's a function of how many experience points you have. And the abilities your character possesses are related to what character class you have, right? So if you're a, a rogue, you're really good at sneaking. You can sneak around, you can backstab people. If you're a mage, you can cast spells, things like that. Same thing with like fighting. If I'm a, if I'm a mage and I'm level 10, I'm terrible at fighting compared to like a warrior who's level 10. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that, like my strength as a mage. I might not build up my strength because I need intelligence as a mage to like, you know, cast spells and things like that. So all those things are interrelated. So when I was exploring this concept, I was like, I think it'd be kind of fun to work on a character generation tool for D&D, &D, and specifically a character generation tool that just pumps out character sheets and encourages you to play the pen and paper game. I wasn't trying to like reinvent D&D &D in some kind of digital format, right? So basically what, what the idea is that you fill out a, war, a web form and uh, it generates a nice PDF for your character. 
You can snapshot your character at different levels, at different points in their adventure and career. And you can preview your character's abilities and their attributes at any point in their career, and also at character creation to where you can say, do I really want to be a wizard with these stats? So the challenges for this project uh, was one that I felt like it was way too small for like Postgres or something on the back end, right? I didn't want to use like a full rail stack really for it, and I didn't really want to use anything too persistent because it's really just lookup tables. Uh, and I wanted to be able to snapshot characters at different points in their career. Um, and I wasn't interested in developing like an engine, so I didn't want to build a game engine and say, I don't know, I can run games virtually in this, in this environment. So like we were talking about before, I started with how do I model a character's level and their experience points just using data structures, right? So in D&D, a character's, character's level is related to the number of experience points they have. So here we have a table, tabular representation of their level versus experience points versus proficiency bonus. Uh, proficiency bonus, for those who don't know, is a modifier that you apply to when you roll a die in D&D. So the other thing to note is that this relationship really never changes. Like, when you get to 900 experience points, you are level two until you get to 2,700 experience points. Um, so as I looked at that table and I kind of took it apart, I saw that it was just a matrix. It's just a multi-dimensional array. And mathematically, this is not extra interesting, but it is a very pragmatic way for us to organize uh, that data in, in a matrix structure, right? So we're just, we're just gonna model the static data using this in code. So my kind of first blast at this was like, well, if I know what levels I have and I know what experience points I need to be at a level, and I know my proficiency bonus, I can literally just zip these up into a complex array, and now I have a lookup table. Unfortunately, you have to know how I organize the table and, and able to really pull data from it, though, right? I mean, what stinks about multi-dimensional arrays is that you have to know the column and the row number in order to really uh, pull data back in an explicit way. Or you have to iterate over those columns and rows to pull data back, which we'll see in a later example is pretty, pretty slow algorithmically. So you could also just pivot that table and turn it into a hash, which is nice for us as humans, so we don't have to keep track of so many numbers, right? We have a reference point to what the row of level zero would be in that table. So I could create a hash, I could iterate over it, and pivot that table, and then put it into a hash, and now I have a complex data structure that I can use to refer to my character. But what if we want to get a little bit more refined with this, or what if we have a little bit more complex data? So yeah, it's fine if you just want to represent a table, right? Um, but what if we have interrelated data in classes? What if we want to use composition for this sort of uh, domain pattern? So say I want to represent a character at any given point in their career. I started going through and just breaking out the character into their subsequent static class parts, right? So for example, uh, the vector of abilities that are allowed or the ability scores that you have in Dungeons and Dragons are strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. So I said, hey, why not just make that a vector of symbols, right? Same thing with a level. I mean, a level is really just a vector from zero to 20. Uh, and then experience points. I didn't want to work backwards and figure out how, what the math is around uh, going through experience levels. I'm lazy. I didn't want to derive that algorithm. So I just put it in a lookup table or a lookup list. And I vectorize that. So now, given those uh, classes that I built, I can just build my character advancement table by zipping up my level vector and my experience vector. And it becomes really easy to refer to later on. So obviously this isn't gonna give you the kind of robust querying you need in a relational database, right? You can't do like joins or certain things like that. But if you're just using something as a reference point, uh, you can uh, use just composition and classes to build that. So this little code snippet is a, shows a method that I built for the character class. Given ability score roles, uh, zip them up and put them into a, a, a key value pair, and now you have your ability scores. So what's a use case for this pattern? So you have a bunch of static lookup tables and you have classes 
that build vectors. Well, modeling complex business logic is actually a lot of times where you're gonna use a pattern like this. Um, depending on how complex that business logic can get, I don't know if you would always wanna keep that in code or in a Ruby process in memory, but it can reduce a lot of cruft. And I mean, at the end of the day, this is really just the composition pattern, right? It's the composition pattern of classes relying on a very simple data structure uh, to refer to. So let's move on to a more mathematical approach, um, which would be solving a systems of equations with matrices. And this is a little bit more focused on mathematics and using the Ruby matrix library for things. Um, I think not a lot of people will probably get a lot of mileage from this code example, but it's interesting to see it work. And it will be good therapy for people like me who remember inverting three by three matrices, so. So let's assume we have these three equations. We wanna solve for the variables in those equations, right? Well, Ruby has a pretty cool matrix library that we can use for this sort of uh, thing. So we can use matrix algebra to solve this system, and we're gonna do it with the ma uh, Ruby matrix library. So the first step, if you remember, you're solving systems of linear equations uh, from school or college or whatever, uh, is you remove coefficients and place them into a coefficient matrix, right? So two, 10, and eight become the first row in our coefficient matrix. Seven and seven are for Y and Z. We don't have an X value, so we assign that zero in the second row. And then we move our third row, uh, our three fives go into third row there. In code, uh, it's just setting up a multi-dimensional array. I, we collect those values and apply typecasting to a rational in the rows because we don't wanna have rounding errors when we actually calculate this stuff. So then we set up our matrix of coefficients in the last line there. Uh, so then we pull out the constants and place them into a matrix. So 54, 30, and 35 go into their own matrix. In code, I was lazy, so I just explicitly typecast each one. There's probably fancier ways to do it. We can play code golf later. Uh, so now solve. Thankfully, computers are awesome at this kind of tedious arithmetic. Uh, solving by hand is much more complicated. You have to get the inverse of that matrix. It's a very intensive operation. I think I counted at least 11 major steps with three or four sub-steps on each step, and it's really complex. Um, then once we've derived that inverse matrix, we would multiply by the constants matrix, right? Which actually can get pretty burly too when you're looking at a three by three matrix. But what's so great for us who have done this on paper is that in code, this is just so beautiful and simple, okay? I just tell the coefficients matrix to invert itself and I multiply by the constants and now I have my solution. So use cases for this pattern. Anytime you're using linear equations to model a problem, which actually might happen more often than you think. Um, I will say though, it's hard, it was hard for me in my, if I was thinking about my recent experience and my experience overall as a developer, can't really say one time when I've literally said, ah, oh, that's a system of linear equations, I'm totally using that. But I'm sure I have, uh, and anytime you need to compare those values in, in an equation form, you're pretty much using that pattern. So I'm, I'd be interested to see if other people have used this. Maybe we can talk about that later. And this only really scratches the surface of matrix operations, but it's a good, simple way of understanding what you can do with matrix operations and how you can solve those equations with that. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on to what's gonna be our third example. Uh, and we're gonna use uh, matrix as a data structure internal to our algorithm. So we're gonna use a matrix in this algorithm to calculate edit distance between strings. This has a specific name, everybody know what it is? It's a Levenstein distance algorithm. So we're gonna calculate a score, we're gonna, we're gonna take a source string and we're gonna try and convert it to a tar target string and we're gonna calculate a score for that and it's gonna be a distance score which is a function of the number of deletions, insertions or substitutions required to transform that source string into a target string. So the greater the edit distance score, the more dissimilar those strings are. 
So the steps of this algorithm are pretty simple. Uh, you build up a matrix using the lengths of the source and target strings. That informs the overall number of rows and columns uh, you need to compare. Then you iterate over each string. And then based on the differences between those two values, you assign a score. Uh, that score is stored in the cell at position x and y, where x is the position of where we're going, uh, we are on the source string, and y is where we are in the target string. Um, interestingly enough, the scores that we care about make up the diagonal of the matrix that we build up in the actual algorithm. So I put together a quick little visualization of what this sequentially looks like as we step through. So as we step through, and we compare these strings, you can see the diagonal of the matrix starting to build up. And in that first case, you can see that we've assigned this score of one. What we'll see when we actually look through the code is that the score is actually the minimum uh, of these three values plus an insertion, substitution, and deletion score that we assign it. And as we iterate through each one, we just build on the next, uh, the next calculation. So given that we're in a row and column of the source string index or the target strings index, we insert the minimum of the following vector in the position we're currently at. So we build up a little formula in our algorithm to derive an edit score value. And that is the minimum of the above cell plus the deletion score, the diagonal cell plus the substitution score, and the left cell plus the insertion score. So if we, let me step back and look at that. Uh, there it is. We look through the code for that. Um, so we have our insertion and our substitution score. We weight our deletion score a little bit more. Uh, and I know that more complex or more robust implementations of Levenstein edit distance uh, allow you to assign scores in different ways and weight scores differently. So our source string is my name, uh, Micah, and our target string is Alice. We initialize a matrix uh, that we're gonna hold our rows and columns in, and then we start building up that first row, uh, and then we, we fill out the rest of the uh, matrix. So we iterate through our target length, target string's length, and we start building up our matrix. <clears throat> And then we do the burly, nasty part, which we're gonna see is probably not the most uh, elegant solution. So we're doing a nested for loop here. Uh, we iterate through our source string, and then we iterate through our target string. We look at where we are in our matrix in the row and column that we're in, and then we calculate our score, uh, which is that minimum kind of computation. Uh, it's the minimum of those, of that vector, essentially. And then we can retrieve the last row and last column, and we get that value, and that's our edit distance score. So what can we say about this algorithm? Well, it's not really the most performant data structure there is. Uh, you're at the mercy of the length of the two strings that you're comparing. Um, and this implementation of Levenstein is probably not the fastest, but, and probably not the most optimized, but it is pretty simple to understand. So, what I like to call this use case for is when you're brute forcing a problem. Uh, and until you can come up with a better, more elegant solution, sometimes it's worth committing the effort into the brute force implementation and figuring out how do I get this to work better. Um, so wrapping up, so what do we go over and what do we talk about? Well, we talked about the field, right, which is a collection of numbers that have properties of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. We talked about field of real numbers. We talked about the Galois field, which is of specific interest to us in computing. Uh, talked about exclusive or in terms of Galois field and addition in, in terms of Galois field. We talked about vectors, which mind blown is pretty much just an array in Ruby. It's a list of scalars, symbols, or functions. Uh, over a specific field, so we showed that vectors can be over Galois field two or the field of real numbers. In Ruby, 
for, for all intents and purposes, it, a hash is really also a vector. It's a list of values. And then we talked about matrices. So an array of vectors over a field organized into rows and columns. All right, we looked at a little bit of matrix manipulation in terms of graphics, graphical processing. We looked at um, some other elements with matrices, including systems of linear equations and our, our Levenstein edit distance. So when you would use a matrix as an internal data structure. So what are they good for? So what are the conclusions after this hypothesis that I came up with? Well, they're good for many things. I think lowest barrier to entry to understanding matrices, though, specifically, you can use them as a way to structure data in order to emphasize its relationships and tease out those relationships. They're a useful tool for solving systems of linear equations and other operations. So like we had talked about in graphics processing or graphical representations, uh, matrices make scaling, moving, and transforming those things very easy. And they are often used as a data structure uh, for procedures and algorithms. Um, which sometimes could be a brute force tactic and is not the most elegant solution for an algorithmic uh, structure, but it sometimes gets the job done as well. So, so I want to open it up for questions in the time that we have kind of remaining if people have questions. Or we can just talk about D&D &D too, that's fine. <laughs> so the question, so I'm supposed to repeat the question. So the question was, is the matrix library part of the standard library? And yes, it is actually. Um, and actually, it's, it's interesting, when I started working with that matrix library, I, I fist fought it quite a bit. So there's some kind of idiosyncrasies with the matrix library that you're gonna probably come up, come up against. Um, but as always, the documentation for it's pretty good, so. <laughs> so the question was, what is the expected general performance when you're doing things with matrix math? Right, as opposed to linear, uh, solving for a system of linear equations? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> that sounds awesome. So what's the name of the gem? Color. It's called Color. So the, the, uh, he's, he's working on a, a color math gem. Uh, I'm actually, that sounds really interesting. So performance wise, I think there's a really good uh, library called nmatrix that could probably help we could include in that. And I'll, I'll check it out. I don't think nmatrix works with JRuby, unfortunately, um, but I would totally love to check out that. Let's get together after the talk, I'll check out that, Jen. That sounds cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Sure, so the question was, uh, or the comment and question was, you can use GPU acceleration or things like that to enhance performance of matrices, right? And he was asking if there's any specific time when I've used that. And honestly, I really haven't. My first foray into true graphics programming or matrix optimized programming was OpenGL, and a lot of that is done for you. Um, it's unfortunate because Ruby, in a lot of ways, it's great for things like scoping out math, but the mathematics libraries are not super intensive. And I feel like at a certain, at a certain level, you're gonna start getting down to like more C++ or like Chrome level code to be able to maximize those things. Right, so the, the next question was, would you expect, uh, or did you have an instance of a matrix manipulation that just totally came out of left field and you didn't expect it? And honestly, no. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it was kind of like, of course this uses a matrix. <laughs> the question was, with the D&D stuff, could I do some predictive, or did I find a way to do predictive modeling um, in the matrices that I used? And the answer is, I didn't go down that path, but it is good to note that you know, matrices are used quite a bit for things like machine learning algorithms. Also, if you're uh, looking at genomic data or even cancer data, that can be also put into a matrix and analyzed. So I think if I wanted to start modeling data that way, yes, there's definitely a use case for that going further down the road. Right, sorry, I, my glass prescription is super old, so I'm like staring like really hard at you guys, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you.